Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, very much. Uh, thank you all for coming out here tonight. Thanks to Tacoma Park for hosting these programs. Um, I haven't done this in a couple years. We've been doing them virtually on YouTube, so it's nice to be back here in, per in uh, per person again rather than doing it virtually. Um, during the pandemic, I went a little batty at times, probably like some of you, and I, I wrote a vintage movie night theme song. So we'll play a little introduction now to start things off. Put on your goggles. Observers without goggles must face away from the blast. On the silent desert, the test objects waited. H minus 10 seconds. Nine. So, Tacoma Park, since 1983, has been a nuclear free zone. I wonder, is it, is it okay for us to show these films? Is there anybody here from the committee? Is it okay to show the... Oh, thank you. But, um, seriously, um, unfortunately, we are all living now, again, with the real threat of nuclear apocalypse, as if we needed something else to keep us all up at night lately. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to revisit, well, informative, maybe not fun, the uh, Cold War or some aspects of the Cold War. The Cold War is a huge topic and there are hundreds, probably thousands of public domain films that I could show. Um, but I did not want to um, make it too serious, so I'm trying to look at things in a little bit more light and entertaining. It was hard for me to narrow it down to 70 minutes, but that's what we have. Uh, all the films I'm showing are in the public domain, which means that they were never copyrighted, their copyright expired, or they were made by the federal government, which means they belong to all of us. I've created sort of a kaleidoscope of short clips from longer films, so we can cover more films, but I've also learned, I've been doing these programs since 2013, and I've learned that the longer unedited films can be tedious, and I don't want you all to walk out or fall asleep and start snoring which has happened before here. Um, <clears throat> but it is great to be in person with all of you because th this is the way these films were meant to be seen. And this is what they would have looked like if some of you young people have never seen those before. This is a 16 millimeter film. That's about 10 minutes right there. The metal box. Um, so what I do, what I have here are several categories of films. I'll play the categories and pause between each to set up the next one. Um, and then maybe we can have a discussion at the end. The first um, category is something a little bit serious. I think uh, because of what's happening in Ukraine, you've probably all heard references to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I thought it would be interesting to start, set the tone with a seven minute clip from a half hour American propaganda film that I believe captures the essence of that moment pretty well. So we could play the first film, please. In 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union stand on the verge of direct military confrontation during one week in October. On 
October 20th, the nation settles down to a weekend of football and tomfoolery. Northwestern meets Ohio State in Saturday's big game. Most of the weekend news seems to come from the West Coast, farthest from Cuba. The Seattle Fair is closing. A Los Angeles florist is selling elephants. As the weekend starts, in a move partly designed to offset counterintelligence about the redeployment, the president resumes pre-election touring. The day before, the Soviet foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, had told Mr. Kennedy that Russia had no offensive weapons in Cuba. Suddenly on Saturday, October 20th, the president cancels his trip and hurries from a rain-swept Chicago back to Washington. The crisis now has reached ahead. All week, reconnaissance planes have been sweeping the island of Cuba. The new intelligence photos are in, and now the evidence is unmistakable. It shows Russian IL-28 Beagle bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And it shows more offensive ballistic missiles being emplaced. These are medium range. These are intermediate range. Both have nuclear strike capabilities. All of the Western Hemisphere, from Hudson Bay to Lima, Peru, is within their range. With the facts now before him, President Kennedy continues to meet with his top advisors and prepares to address the nation. Now begins a period of intensive public guessing. The date is October 22nd. I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, where they're found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. I have directed the continued and increased close surveillance of Cuba and its military buildup. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventualities. Third, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. There follows 24 hours of intensive civilian and diplomatic activity, and the nation lines up behind the president. I'd hate like heck to see us go to war, but if it's necessary to, uh, to prevent a nuclear war, I think uh, the action has to be taken at this time. Well, I think it's uh, high time we uh, stop Russia from having things her own way. We only have a few more months to go on reserves, and I just hope they don't grab me, that's all. I know that some action should be taken, but uh, he's going to have to tread very lightly short of war. I think it's gone beyond the stage of whether or not we support uh, the president uh, or we don't support him. It's way past that. Suddenly, the idea of civil defense no longer seems either useless or foolish. Suddenly, millions of Americans are asking one question. How can I make my family safe? Suddenly, it seems very important to have adequate supplies in every home. In some parts of the country, supermarket shelves are stripped bare. Yet, if the worst had come, most of these second thoughts would have been too late. the nation, local government authorities and civil defense organizations step up the pace of stocking their community fallout shelters with essential supplies.
In a world in which no family is beyond the range of nuclear warheads, civil defense cannot be a sometime thing. It is all the time, or it is no defense at all. Men and women the world over hang on the news. No one can be sure that he and his family will still be alive at this time tomorrow. On Sunday morning, a message reaches the White House from Moscow. Press Secretary Salinger announces that Chairman Khrushchev has agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba and reads Mr. Kennedy's reply to the Soviet Premier. The President already has left the White House to attend services at his church. in October, perhaps the most frightening week the world has ever known, is over. I have a series of short clips arranged here in sort of a collage to represent many of the different kinds of nuclear survival films. And between the clips, I've added uh, test detonations in the Nevada desert just as sort of punctuations. And this, uh, this collection of films is about 25 minutes long. Right now, as you're watching this program, suppose you suddenly heard the wail of the alert. Would you know what to do? First, keep calm. Panic simply wastes valuable time. Gather all canned goods, blankets, and extra clothing. Don't forget a flashlight, a can opener, portable radio, and extra batteries. Fill all available bottles with water. Take everything to the shelter. If no shelter is available, go to a basement corner without windows. Stay inside your shelter until you're told it's safe to leave. You could have made things easier for yourself by preparing all these things before the emergency occurred. Clicking sounds, sounds that reveal the presence of radioactive rays. The instrument, a Geiger counter, is converting radioactivity into sounds we can hear. This radioactivity is coming from a small piece of radioactive material inside this plastic cylinder. The small amount of radioactivity coming from the cylinder is harmless. The luminous dial on this watch also gives off radioactive rays, which we hear on the Geiger counter. Even when there's no radioactive material near, the Geiger counter continues to click. This is caused by cosmic radiation that continually bombards us from outer space. But we don't get enough cosmic radiation to harm us. Today, atomic scientists produce radioactivity in large amounts. Radioactivity and radioactive materials have many peacetime uses. But we know, too, that they can be used harmfully, as in atomic bombs. The chance of your being hurt by an atomic bomb is slight. But since there is a chance, you must know how to protect yourself. To protect yourself, you have to know what the bomb does. Besides blast, there's radioactivity and heat. 
Can we protect ourselves from these? These children are protected. Concrete walls help stop radioactivity. Any wall stops the heat. The heat scorches the house, but does not harm the children. Any solid gives some protection. The thicker it is, the better. We have the national defenses to intercept an enemy, and we all form a team to help each other through emergencies. You are on that team. Dum dum, diddle dum dum, diddle dum dum, diddle dum dum. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He duck and cover, duck and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you duck and cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you are not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion, it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like Bert the Turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, they are talking about the atomic bomb, too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? And her teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. We think that most of the time we will be warned before the bomb explodes, so there will be time for us to get into our homes, schools, or some other safe place. Sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover, and do it fast. Here are some older boys showing what to do if the flash comes when you are not in the classroom. This is what to do if you should be in a corridor. You duck and cover tight against the wall this way. Remember to keep your face in the back of your neck covered tightly. Try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. You might be eating your lunch when the flash comes. Duck and cover under the table. Then, if the explosion makes anything in the room fall down, it can't fall on you. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. Paul and Patty know this, and they're always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day. But no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned, and Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover. Yes, we must all get ready now, so we know how to save ourselves if the atomic bomb ever explodes near us. If you do not know just what to do, ask your teacher when this film is over. Discuss what you could do in different places if a bomb explodes. Older people will help us as they always do, but there might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then, you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck 
And cover. Duck. And cover. Duck. And cover. Almost every home has a potential shelter. Take a good look around your home. Find the safest area. Then decide what needs to be done to add to the protection. But don't let that enthusiasm carry you away. Have an organized plan. Getting that home shelter built is mighty important to you and your family. I'm glad you could come down to see my fallout shelter. Just finished painting it last night. Looks like a nice job, Wal. You know, this shelter is a real good idea. If we should ever have a nuclear war, we could get a heavy fallout even though we were not anywhere near the target area. So Ruth and I got to thinking about it and we figured we'd rather be prepared than sorry. You know, Walt, this gives me an idea. Remember I was thinking about building a dark room in my basement? There's no reason why I couldn't use it for that, too. Well, this would make a perfect dark room, as well as a fallout shelf. Come on in, see the inside. Gee, isn't this nice? Well, Sir Ruth and I certainly can live in here very comfortably for at least two weeks. And you know, this room can be put to other uses as well. Yes, Walt. You could use this as an extra bedroom for company. Yeah, and when those grandchildren come, it'd be a great place to put them. You certainly have this well stocked. Radio, extra batteries, fire extinguisher. Yeah, that's right. And you know, besides being a fallout shelter, it's a good place to be during a tornado. Walt, you've done a real good job. To begin with, the best way to build anything is the right way. So I got this bulletin. It's the official bulletin put out by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization, called the Family Fallout Shelter. Another booklet is available from the National Concrete Missionary Association. подтвердила, что Советский Союз имеет в своем распоряжении термоядерное оружие мощностью 50, 100 и более мегатонн. enemy attack has just occurred. The first hours of shelter occupation are characterized by confusion, rumors, noise. Small groups gather. They discuss their situation, their new and strange location. This, however, is not the case with all shelter occupants. Some withdraw, freeze, become a member of no group. But there is one common value, one pervading thought, self-preservation. Self-protection. Self. Social values must return before individuals will function as a group. Luckily, the needs to achieve this are few. Organization. Leadership. 
recreation, training, empathy with fellow shelter occupants. But these needs are led by the need for information. The quality of the shelter's information program will have a great effect on the success of the survival effort. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. All right, quiet now, please. Come on, hold it down. Let's listen to this. This is Governor Haynes. This is an official announcement. The nation has sustained a nuclear attack. Luckily, only a few of our cities have been hit, and our citizens are now entering into shelters. If we stay in our shelters, we will survive. Your local authorities will give you reports as they are received. In the meantime, remember, stay in your shelter. We need food and water to survive. But if fallout settles on your food, the food itself isn't harmed or made radioactive, since radiation only damages living tissue. You simply remove the fallout particles using everyday methods of food preparation. attacks us with nuclear weapons. Danger will come not just from blast, or heat, or nearby radiation effect, but also from fallout. Fallout, which may occur miles and miles away from the blast. You need to know about fallout, what it is, how to detect it, and what to do to protect yourself against it. Everybody needs to know. Yes, this does mean you. Watch and listen. One day, these facts may save your life. What is this fallout, anyhow? Just bits of radio act fallout of the mushroom cloud of the nuclear explosion and settle on the ground. These bits of matter can be dangerous. You are exposed to some radiation every day from cosmic rays or other natural sources of radiation. These exposures are too small to hurt you. But when a wartime nuclear explosion occurs, a serious fallout follows. Thousands of tons of atomized earth Building materials, rocks, and gases may be thrown into the air. And the mushroom cloud containing them sometimes moves as high as 100,000 feet, nearly 20 miles up. Some of the radioactive particles spill out near the explosion site. Others may be carried for 10, 50, 100 miles or more. But how will you know if there is fallout? You can't hear, smell, taste, or see the radiation. But you yourself can detect the fallout particles that produce it. The easiest time to do this without special instruments is when the fallout is settling through the air. This starts any time from about one half hour to several hours after the explosion, depending on how far away you are and it continues to fall for an hour or longer. Usually, you can see the fallout. So if there has been an explosion of a nuclear weapon within a few hundred miles of you, you should suspect every unusual concentration of dust in the air of being fallout. After an explosion in daylight, watch any unusual accumulation of dust. At night, put a white or light-colored plate outside. Examine it every 15 minutes or so. If dust is accumulated on the plate, treat it as fallout. 
The particles in that fallout behave like miniature X-ray machines, sending out radiation in all directions. If there are many particles, and if you are exposed to them long enough, you will be hurt. With a degree of accuracy four times greater than any gun developed before World War II, the 280 millimeter gun has proven its worth. Capable of delivering the atomic shell some 13 miles under any weather condition, day or night, the big gun provides more accurate and damaging support to ground troops than any other gun in the recorded history of warfare. Energy Commission's Nevada test site, I covered the story of Operation Q, a program to test the effects of an atomic blast upon the things we use in our everyday lives. I wanted to see Operation Q through my own eyes and through the eyes of the average citizen. I arrived at Civil Defense Headquarters the day before the explosion was scheduled to take place and checked in at once with an official for a briefing on the test. To give me a perspective of the entire test layout, a member of the Civil Defense staff showed me a carefully prepared model of the site. He explained the scope of the test and the detailed care with which it had been planned. We begin with the question of shelter, for shelter might save the lives of those far enough from ground zero. But what kinds of shelter are effective? Several types are to be tested, from elaborate industrial shelters to a box-like family shelter in the corner room of a basement. Through the cooperation of the furniture and appliance industries, household furnishings were installed in the houses. Mannequin families were supplied by private industry. Interior home furnishings, also donated by industry, were complete in every detail. Textiles and synthetic fabrics were also to be tested. Rows of mannequins are set up in the open facing the blast. Each item of clothing and each color has been carefully selected. As a mother and housewife, I was particularly interested in the food test program, a test that included canned and packaged foods. A small group of civil defense volunteers were to occupy a trench relatively close to ground zero. On Media Hill, where I remained, there was hot coffee, last minute briefings, and more waiting. H minus one minute. Put on your goggles. Observers without goggles must face away from the blast. On the silent desert, the test objects waited. H minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero.
24 hours elapsed before we were permitted to view at first hand the results of the explosion. Although the redesigned two-story frame house was severely damaged, the structural improvements had strengthened its resistance considerably. The basement shelter had offered some degree of protection. The reinforced bathroom shelter was standing intact beneath the ruins of the house, so this type also offered some degree of protection. The food and cases of canned goods were taken away for laboratory tests. A tattoo mark was left beneath the dark pattern of this dress. The blast charred and faded the outer layer of this dark suit. During all this activity, the mass feeding group had been improvising to feed the test observers. These cans could have been salvaged from demolished buildings and used for preparing meat. As I watched the people eating, I realized that mass feeding would be an important job for civil defense. Multi-megaton weapons would result in much greater damage over a larger area. But many lessons were learned from this test that have affected civil defense planning. All these factors must be considered as we plan for the survival of our homes, our families, and our nation in the nuclear age. Uh, you people in the audience probably know this already, but I, I looked up, I was just curious about the Nevada test site, so um, I looked up through the Atomic Heritage Foundation. Between 1951 and 1962, in the, the Nevada test site was home to 928 atmospheric and underground nuclear tests. 100 of them were, were above the surface of the Earth. Um, the amount of radiation released in those tests is the equivalent of 20 Chernobyls. So this has resulted in a tragic legacy of cancer for downwinders, residents of the American West, and atomic veterans. You can learn more about that at atomicheritage.org. So propaganda, uh, just one film to show here, but um, I wanted to show this one because I was, I was at the National Archives doing research one time and I was having fun with the archivists, I said, what, um, what, what are some of your favorite films that nobody's ever seen, that nobody's ever heard of? And somebody showed me this one. It's a, it's a United States Information Agency film that sort of blatantly explains their propaganda efforts in the battle of ideas with the Soviet Union. And it has some interesting examples of Soviet propaganda as well. So I picked uh, seven minutes of the 30 minute film to show you, and I've posted the entire film to our, our YouTube channel, which is Nerds Make Media, if you want to watch the whole thing. Today, the greatest threat to peace is the expansionist aims of the Kremlin. Already, one out of three, 800 million people are prisoners behind the Iron Curtain. Just outside the Soviet orbit, another billion in Europe, the Near East, and the Far East are threatened. Freedom everywhere, our freedom, is in jeopardy. A primary tool of Soviet aggression is propaganda. It was through propaganda that the North Koreans were prepared for their attack on South Korea. Between 1945 and 49, they were saturated with Soviet propaganda. By June of 1950, the North Koreans were sufficiently Sovietized to accept the signal from Moscow to make a fanatical onslaught against their brothers. Soviet reliance on propaganda can also be measured by the money they spend. Right now, the Soviet Union is spending more than a billion dollars a year on propaganda. If we add the expenditures of the satellites and red China, the figure exceeds three billion. Expensive lying. The principal target of these lies is the United States. Since 1948, the Soviets have been carrying on a vicious propaganda attack on every phase of U.S. life. 
Typical of the way they distort the truth are the scenes which we shall see in a moment from a Soviet newsreel prepared for East Germans. Using American film, carefully edited and narrated, the Soviets presented it as the truth about America. New York glitters in a thousand colors, the jazz drum beat, skyscrapers and big city ribbons. A good backdrop for the USA's biggest circus act. The biggest propaganda press in the world, unequal, unbeatable. Why doesn't the lion bite? Because he prefers Wrigley's chewing gum. The most beautiful legs in the world, on view only in the USA. Sensation, sensation. The airplane crashes. The car burns deep in the heart of Texas. Broadway at night, the greatest sea of lights in the 20th century. Do you know that these demigods, like all the other American film actors, are obliged by contract to let themselves be photographed in all sorts of imaginable poses, half-dressed or without any clothes at all, just like a cheap pin-up girl? The actors do not want to do it, but they are forced to. This is what they call artistic freedom. The Super Review, the most beautiful women, the most beautiful clothes. This is the way Tom, Dick, and Harry see America. And that's how they should see it. But behind the facade, it looks very different. While dogs get manicures in beauty salons, over two million Americans are today without work. And according to official statements, the number of unemployed will rise to four million by spring. Another five million are part-time workers. Working men hungry? Unimportant. What is important is that prices don't fall. So away with the milk and the grain. Millions living in slums? Unimportant. The facade hides everything. Negroes in the limelight, but only as harmless, hand-picked ornaments. Their brothers and sisters rot, beasts of burden without rights in the paradise of freedom. Louder and louder, the voice of the people is heard in America too, the voice of the other America. Today it still gags, today the billy sticks still govern. In the name of Western freedom, terrorism versus progress. In the name of dollar democracy, police versus workers. But how much longer? The facade will fall. In the USA, as everywhere in the world, nothing can stop the people's victory. But they do not stop with these distortions of American life. The Kremlin has accused us, for example, of brutal atrocities in Korea, such as they portray in this lurid poster. Through such anti-American propaganda, the Kremlin is trying to drive a wedge between the United States and the rest of the free world. Their peace offensive, illustrated by this Soviet propaganda poster, is also closely related to this effort to isolate the United States. It illustrates the Soviet claim that they are exerting their full weight for peace against the warmongers of the West. As great as the Soviet menace is, there are problems in the free world of equal or greater significance. This is the area of decision in the struggle to preserve freedom. Here we have millions of friends, but many of them are uninformed or misinformed about the United States and the differences between communism and democracy. Others are suspicious, jealous, or openly antagonistic. For example, a poll taken by the French Institute of Public Opinion in January of 1953 brought out the fact that an alarming number of the Frenchmen question believe that Americans have poor taste, are overgrown children, are only interested in money. A surprising number of the Frenchmen polled also think most Americans live in skyscrapers and have no family life. The false impressions such as these are by no means confined to the French. A positive effort must be made to overcome these misconceptions. In many areas of the world, the people are not yet committed in the struggle between freedom and slavery. These regions are crucial. For if these people are lost, strategic areas 
and irreplaceable resources go with them. Resources such as tungsten, copper, mica, oil, bauxite, hemp, materials which are vital for economic progress in peacetime and which might spell the difference between victory and defeat should war come. While many of these lands are potentially rich, the people who subsist on them are faced with the age-old problems of poverty, hunger, ignorance, and disease. Disease weakens and discourages its victims. Discouragement leads to desperation, a fertile breeding ground for communism. The communist agitator will be found wherever these conditions exist, haranguing his potential victims, plying his trade of false promises. And he organizes mobs to demonstrate against the governments of the West. Now, considering the importance of these areas and the intensity of communist activity, we must do everything we can to convince the people that their future lies with us and not with communism. In this job, deeds are more important than words. What we say must be matched by what we do. Another effective way of reaching peoples in the free world is through motion pictures. Motion pictures excel in bringing to life remote places, peoples, and events. Audiences totaling a half a billion a year gather in halls, theaters, and on hillsides to see USIS films. Narrations of these films have been prepared in 38 languages and dialects. Most USIS films are documentaries. They're designed to provide factual information and show the identity of our interests with those of other people. For example, USIS films have brought to millions of people the true story of how Chinese prisoners of war were cared for in United Nations prison camps. Our foreign policy in action often provides a splendid opportunity to dramatize our story in motion pictures. The time, 1951. The place, Iran, during the locust plague. This is the old way of fighting locusts. This plane from the United States brings with it a modern method of fighting locusts, smaller planes equipped for aerial spraying. Talk of a decadent America falls hollow on the ears of people who have seen these pictures of aid sent 10,000 miles when it was needed. By means of a mobile van, the USIS is able to exhibit films in remote areas that do not have projection facilities or even electricity. Other information is also distributed from the van, and here the USIS team puts up the latest edition of the Photo Review, a bulletin containing pictures dealing with significant events of the day. The screen and movie projector are made ready for the evening show. Now this USIS film showing is an important event in the village. Most of the townspeople turn out. There's no limit to what American citizens and industry can do to persuade other free peoples that their goals are similar to those of the United States. The United States Information Agency stands ready to help Americans help themselves in doing this vital job. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't highlight the coup in Iran that we sponsored and destroyed their democracy, they just the locusts, I don't understand. Um, so we have, uh, well, there's actually 13,000 U.S. information agency films at the National Archives. And I think only f somebody told me like 400 or 500 of them are online, so it's an untapped resource for people interested in making films or doing research. Um, so Red Scare film, I thought was important to show one of those. Uh, this one's called Freedom and You from 1962. It um, includes many Hollywood B actors, including Jack Webb of Dragnet, who is the host. And it was reportedly modeled on the TV series Twilight Zone. This film has its own wiki entry, so you can read about it. Um, it was originally designed for the military, but it was re-edited and, and uh, repackaged. They liked it so much and distributed widely in American schools under the title Red Nightmare. So um, I've condensed this down from half an hour to about 15 minutes. Frightening, isn't it? From all appearances, this community could be in Iowa, California, 
for Tennessee. It looks like an American town, as American as apple pie and ice cream. As a matter of fact, you can find apple pie here and ice cream too. But appearances are deceptive. This is not an American town. It isn't even in the United States. However, it may be assumed that such a town does exist, shrouded in secrecy and protected by utmost security, deep behind the Iron Curtain. Russia seems to have plenty of barbed wire to enslave its own people, to keep freedom out. You might call this a college town, communist style, as part of a long range plan to destroy our free way of life. These young communists are studying the economic, political, and religious institutions that are the very heartbeat of America. They're studying you, the way you talk and think. They're becoming acquainted with supermarkets, baseball games, and hot dogs, with all the precious freedoms which Americans so casually enjoy. The courses here in this strangest of all schools Espionage as a science, propaganda as an art, sabotage as a business. This nameless American city, deep in the vastness of the Soviet Union, it stands as a symbol of Russian treachery, of long-range communist conspiracy. This town may appear to be an accurate likeness of a typical American community, but it's a fraud. It isn't free. Now, let's take a look at a genuine American town and a genuine American. I want you to meet Jerry Donovan. He's proud of his country, but prone to take his liberties for granted. Well, he's aware that someone must assume responsibility for those liberties, for our free way of life. Yet, when there's a job to be done, Jerry, like so many Americans, is apt to ask, why me? Well, the answer to that question affects Freedom, and you. This is Jerry's house, and that's Jerry's little boy, Jimmy. He's the fastest runner in his class. But even champion runners sometimes get balled out by their coaches. This is coach Helen Donovan. Oh, incidentally, she's Jimmy's mother. That hand, you see, belongs to Linda Donovan, girl mechanic and oldest daughter of the Donovan clan. This young man who looks like a lovesick St. Bernard is Bill Martin, Linda's boyfriend. This dignified young lady is Sally Donovan, escorting Jerry Donovan as he leaves for work. She has a special interest in Jerry. He's her father. The Donovans, happy, healthy, contented, living in a land they're proud of. It's a nice picture. But there's one thing Morning, wrong. Steve. With Say, Eddie, how's that new reel working? Hi, George. How goes it? Morning, Bertha. What'd you say? Good morning, Bertha. Oh. <laughs> Bertha, that's what I call my lathe. It's sort of a nickname. All right, sweetheart, the vacation is over. Now we go to work. Hey, be careful, boy. Don't want anything to happen to that bowling hand. Hey, Pete, I was pretty good last night, wasn't I? Well, not bad. Not bad? See the way I picked off that last 5'10 spear? A little hook and zoom right on the button, huh? Yeah, well, too bad it was a practice game. You better save a little of that luck for the league championship. Luck, you say? Say, Pete, the old master is not going to lose his touch. OK, master, I'll sleep easy. <laughs> See you later. Hey, Jerry, you going to make the meeting tonight? No, I can't. Well, that sounds pretty important. Management's getting together with our union committee to iron out some differences you ought to show. Not a chance. The in-laws are in town. Helen wants me to stay home, I swap jokes with the old boy. Anything to keep her happy, you know how that is. Sure, buddy. I'm a married man myself, remember? See ya. Anybody home? Oh, hi there, partners. What? Hey, what is this? You bad guy, take away our lease. What? He's on the warpath. You better say. 
Stand for the cavalry. Take no prisoner. Tie him up on hill of red ants. Oh, now, wait a minute. I don't happen to like ants. You sit on that hill. You, uh, now, you got this all wrong. You see, I happen to be a good guy. Sit. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, where are you going? Get them honey. Ants love honey. Oh, now, all just right, a minute. All right, I... Indians, time to wash up. Dennis, almost done. Ah, 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 ah. Right now. Dessert in the wigwam later. Oh, come on! Well, you saved me from a fate worse than death. Oh? How come we're even been so early tonight? Well, you, don't you remember you? I have a union committee meeting tonight. I just want to make sure you could make it. Uh, yeah, that, well, uh, they don't expect me. I told them that your folks were coming here for dinner tonight. Oh, honey, Mom and Dad aren't due in for another week yet. Now you have plenty of time for the meeting, huh? Helen, you don't understand. I knew that your folks weren't going to be here tonight. You knew? You... Mm -hmm. we... Well, then why all I just told that to the fellas to keep from going tonight. Oh. Besides, my favorite TV show is on. Would you want to miss that, would you? Would you? Well, Jerry, you missed the last meeting. Don't you think you should be there? Honey, nothing ever happens at those meetings. Now, in a few minutes, Jerry Donovan, father, fisherman, machinist, and loyal American, will be asleep. But tonight, instead of the sweet dreams his wife wished him, let's give Jerry a nightmare, a real red nightmare. Get off to Sunday school, all right? Boy, it's a beautiful day. As soon as they get back from Sunday school, why don't we all pile into the car and go over... Hey, what is this? Someone going on a trip? You could call it a trip. Actually, the children are going away to a state school. Now, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I don't know what's happened to you or what they've done to change you, but you're not going to send these kids away. Oh, she's not sending us away. It was our idea. We learned in school that home life does not encourage the growth of the collective character which the party wishes to develop in its young people. It's your fault. You should have spent more time training us to think along party lines. Instead, you yourself have been guilty of deviationism and bourgeois sentimentalism. As a member of the Young Pioneers, it will be my duty to report you. Now you better listen to me, all of you. I don't want to hear any more talk about state schools and party lines and collective character and deviationism. This is going to be a family again, and I know just where to start. You two are going to Sunday school, and you're going right now. Mommy, tell her! It's no use to argue. Mom! This Mom. time, I'm going to overrule the party. Come on. Dad! They've been poisoning you kids with those lies long enough. Now you're really going to find out what the truth is all about. We tried to tell you, Dad, but you wouldn't listen. There is no more Sunday school. Please take us home now, Daddy. Everybody's looking at us. It's a mistake. Somebody made a big mistake. Come on, we're gonna get this straight now, right now. Come on. Come on inside. Come on, Jimmy. What's happened? What have they done? Keep your voice down, comrade. Otherwise, I shall have to report you. Who put these displays in here? This is a house of worship. You are mistaken. This is the People's Museum. And I am warning you once more. This place is a lie. Everything about it is false. These models? This. This was not invented by a Russian. The man's name was Bell Alexander Graham Bell. And he was an American. Get that, comrade. Everything on this table is as phony as the town. The rotten system you call communism. Yeah. Comrade Donovan, you are accused of the following crimes against the state, subversion, deviationism, and treason. You have been given this opportunity to make a public confession of your treacherous violations. 
Now, just a minute. This is supposed to be a trial. Who says I'm guilty of anything? Where's your proof? The state needs no proof. It is up to you to prove your innocence. But how can I prove my innocence if I don't know what I'm accused of? Subversion against whom? Deviationism from what? Treason against what government? The prisoner has been given his opportunity to confess. I ask now that he be sentenced. Now, wait a minute. You, you've got to listen to me. They say I'm guilty of crimes against the state, but it's the state that committed the crimes. Why, they broke into my home without a warrant. Armed soldiers. They took away my daughter. They desecrated a house of worship and replaced religious objects with, with phony displays, and they called it a museum. They even tried to turn my own kids against me. My wife. Helen, you were there. You know that what I'm saying is true. Tell them. Mrs. Donovan, this document contains your signed statement. It proves that your husband tried to turn your children against the communist state. Is the statement true? Yes. A brainwashed slave is no match for a free man in any kind of a fight. And don't you forget it. You hear me? Don't you ever forget it. Comrade Donovan, you've been convicted of crimes against the supreme communist government. Being an enemy of the state, you must be liquidated. I have been commissioned to carry out your sentence. What, no firing squad? I'm afraid not. However, you are hereby granted one final chance to confess your crimes. If you wish, a recorder will be summoned to take down your statement. I have a statement to make, all right, but you can deliver it. You just tell your government that someday its own people are going to get wise to it. Someday there's going to be enough holes in that iron curtain that all of your people will be able to escape to freedom. You'll never be able to build a wall strong enough to hold them. One of my own countrymen once said, you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Believe me, you communists can't keep fooling the entire world. You can't even keep fooling your own people. Because the news about communism is getting around that it's only another word for slavery. Don't worry, Jerry. That bullet will never reach you. Because it's time to bring you back from your red nightmare. What you have seen is not entirely fiction. Greater brutality is taking place right now in countries which have been swallowed up by the communist machine. We know that Jerry is waking. Let's see if his dream has impressed him. Helen? Yes, darling. Helen, Honey, I... the kit's polished off the eggs. Would you mind cereal? Cereal will be fine, just fine. I'll get it just a minute. Good morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Daddy, will you buy me a new space helmet? A what? He's gone from wide open spaces to outer space. Oh, he is, is he? Yeah, I guess we can put you in orbit all right. You get a space helmet. Hey, Mom! Jerry knows now, so he'll never forget it. Responsibilities are a privilege, an inherent American right, the strength of our nation. The bright hopes of a free world are founded on the dedication of individual Americans, people who guarantee freedom by standing ready to fight against aggression. Freedom, no single word in all the languages of mankind has come to mean so much. Freedom to enjoy the simple things of life, in the circle of family and friends. Freedom to work at a vocation of our choosing. To vote in open elections for the candidate we believe best qualified. To come, to go as we please. 
freedom to own property, to enjoy the priceless heritage of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to marry and raise a family with belief in the dignity of the human spirit, to study in the field of our choice, to speak our beliefs, to worship God. These freedoms that spell America. They represent a way of life that has become the farthest advancement of mankind on this planet. The world community is always threatened, as it is at this very minute, by predatory nations poised to destroy, to devastate, to enslave the world's people. To prevent communism from consuming the entire free world, there stands but one man. That man is you, the individual the America. You and millions more like you. As our military might guards the continued existence of freedom and peace under God, our strength and shield is you, the civilian who respects his responsibilities and the American in uniform. So that, uh, that keeps going on. It's kind of strange that it went to color at the end just to show the weaponry. Um, but I thought it was important to hear a little bit of um, the American exceptionalism that is very common in a lot of these films. And um, if you want to hear more examples of it, all you have to do is turn on Fox News any day and you can hear the same kind of thing. Um, so I, an antidote to the film we just saw is uh, the next choice. It was funded by the Methodist Church in 1955 and made by Centron Productions in Kansas City. Uh, they made a lot of interesting films. I've shown a few of them here before. They had discussion films with the end of the film there would be a question mark and the class was supposed to discuss bullying, prejudice, loneliness, things like that. This one's called The Sound of a Stone. It's 30 minutes and I've cut it down to about 13. Um, so Without further ado. could be pretty content to spend the rest of his life right in this spot contemplating nature. <laughs> you wouldn't be so happy when December got here with the snow all up around your ears. What would you do without all the kids? Find school teacher you'd make with nobody to teach. Always some little thing to spoil a perfect dream, isn't there? And you say this teacher assigned the book for your English class to read? Well, yes, but... Ernie, what would you say if I told you that this book your Mr. Jordan gave you to read is on a list of subversive publications I got in the mail last week? Subversive? Mr. Jordan wouldn't do a thing like that, not on purpose. How do you know he wouldn't? What do you really know about this fellow Jordan? Well, he's a nice guy, that's all, Dad. And he's a good teacher. He gets you really interested in what he's teaching. Yeah, I'll bet he does. I'm getting interested in what he's teaching myself. Mighty interested, as a matter of fact. And I believe there are other people in this town that'll be interested, too. Hello, J.D. This is Ernest Hughes. What do you know about this Henry Jordan at the high school? You're right, I am mad. Got a book here my son Ernie brought home. Deep Torrent by James Brown. Well, I'll tell you what about it. It's subversive. It's on the list. This fellow Jordan put the book on a recommended reading list he gave the kids in the English class. Looks to me like this red business is getting a foothold right in our own schools. That's serious business, Ernest. I'll say it's serious business. Got to get to the bottom of it. I'll find out what I can about Jordan. I had no idea this was going on. Franklin, J.D. Scott speaking. 
Ever hear anything about the teacher at the high school, a Henry Jordan being a communist? Communist? No, don't believe I have. Where'd you get that story? Well, Ernie Hughes called well, me on the I phone a while ago. I thought I'd ought to check school. with you. As I understand it, that's what a PTA is for. And I see no reason why this subject shouldn't be discussed tonight. We can't shut our eyes to this. Let's get it out in the open. If there's a real danger here, we ought to know about it. I'm inclined to agree with Mrs. Johnson. I believe this business should be brought out in the open. Now, I'm not going to pull any punches, but I know there's a real danger and I'm going to point it out to you. Tonight, there sits in this room, right here among us, a man who's trying to poison the minds of our children. You've read about these people sneaking their way into our schools and even our churches, but if you're like me, you never thought you'd find one right in your own midst. And I, for one, would like to know what Mr. Henry Jordan has to say for himself. Mr. Hughes, are you accusing Henry Jordan of subversion? That's what I said. May I ask? On what ground? It seems to me that any teacher who makes his classes read subversive literature is obviously a subversive himself. And I know what I'm talking about because my son Ernie brought one of these books home. A book Mr. Henry Jordan assigned for his classes to read. Mr. Hughes, may I ask the title of this subversive book you say I assigned? Deep Torrent by James Brown. Oh. Mr. Hughes, I can appreciate your concern, but let me assure you that Deep Torrent is not subversive literature. It's long been recognized. Oh, I expect you to deny it, Jordan. That book is on a list of subversive publications, and I have the list right here to prove it. Mr. Hughes, I can assure you I have no intention of ever... Here's proof! How can you argue with it? Mr. Travis? The only way that we can really get this fellow, Jordan, is to take this business to the school board. School board. I move we adjourn. I move we adjourn. Hello, son. Hello. What's the matter, son? Nothing. What's the matter, Ernie? Ernie? All right, son, what's bothering you? Ernie! Now I'm a communist. You're a what? The kids say I'm a communist, like you say Mr. Jordan is. Why, that's ridiculous. Who ever got an idea like that? Several of them. Mr. Jordan and I get along all right. I'm editor of the school paper, and he's the advisor, and I write an editorial, and he approves it, and that makes us both communists. Oh, that's nonsense, Ernie. They can't call you a communist, not only more than that. Then what are they calling Mr. Jordan one for? Well, now, that's different, son. How is it different? Well, uh, well, he, he made his class read a subversive book, didn't he? That's what everybody's saying, but they're saying that I wrote a subversive editorial. That makes me mad, Ernie. That just makes me good and mad. They're trying to mix you up in this dirty mess. Who are they to say that your editorial is subversive? Well, who are you to say that? the book, Dad? You even read the book? I can assure you that this school board is prepared to take whatever action is necessary. But we feel it is our duty to see this thing through. And now, please, can we have order? Yeah, order. Yes, Dr. McMillan. Friends, friends, I can't tell you how deeply troubled I've been by the problem here. You see, I've known Henry Jordan since he was a boy. I know his father and his mother. 
And I know the kind of people they've always been as members of my church. I know Henry Jordan is a devout and dependable man of God. And a man who is that can't possibly be what you've accused him of being. To my way of thinking, he has been victimized. Excuse me, Dr. McMillan, but maybe you've been victimized. We've got proof. Ernie Hughes can bear me out on that. If you'll permit me a moment, Dr. McMillan. If there's a man here tonight guilty of misdoing, I'm that man. I charged Henry Jordan with subversion. I did it in what I thought was good faith. But I find out now that it was really prompted by ignorance. I've read the book. I've read the book. This deep torrent by James Brown. If I'd done it in the first place, I could have saved Mr. Jordan all the hurt I know I've caused him, and all the hurt it's caused even my own son. Deep Torrent was written over 60 years ago and has been in the school library since I was a boy. It's a novel, and as far as I'm concerned, although I don't like the book, it is not subversive. That's the proof, and the only proof we have against Henry Jordan. And I hope that Mr. Jordan and all of you can accept my deepest and most sincere apologies for the mess I've stirred up here. contrast to what it was before. <laughs> I wonder if you know how we felt. I think it's the most desolate feeling I've ever known when the people you live with all of a sudden turn against you. Well, anyway, it's all over now. And I believe the town may have learned a lesson from what happened to you, Henry. People were beginning to get suspicious of each other. You know, it's a funny thing. <laughs> You never fooled us. Get out while you can. I guess it's going to be a bigger job than we thought. Small incidents magnify like a stone thrown into the water until the cause of the disturbance and what it really means is hidden by the rippling of the waves, touching everything, even shores for which were never intended. Who knows what a stone carelessly thrown may bring? Who knows? That's it. It'd be interesting to know, to hear your comments. I kind of felt like that stone going through the window was 2022 smashing through the window and saying, we're still here. Um, but, you know, fortunately we don't have school board meetings like that anymore. Um, so, does anybody have any comments about what you've seen? Or? If you could wait for the microphone, I think they're recording this. Coming around. First, I'd like to say thanks so much, Richard. That was just a terrific screening, and I felt like uh, 
Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was great. I, I was in the Los Vegas Metro Center and I was in Las Vegas not too long ago and I heard that the groundwater under the city, the aquifer, is uh, perennially polluted by what happened there in the test testing zones. I wonder if anyone else has heard about that. Uh, I, I subscribe to a magazine called High Country News. It's a, uh, News of the West, so I don't get too of an inside the beltway <laughs> mentality, but they had a recent article. Uh, this is the testing ground, and um, that's, that's all of the underground explosions. One of those craters is 1,200 feet wide. Um, but I, I, I mean, yeah, I was kind of surprised when I read about that, how close to Las Vegas some of those tests were. And um, there was one of them that really went bad, and they said that the fallout fell on 3,000 American counties. It's called, it was a test called Harry, and they call it Dirty Harry. <laughs> but I'm not an expert on that stuff. It's just kind of crazy what we were doing at that time. And what for? I guess, I guess this seems so pertinent now as we're looking at the what's going on in the world thinking that you know this do we need to start get teaching our kids to get back under the desks that when they're hiding from guns at this point and they need to do something else and and I and I was thinking too some of the things I was reading about you know that when we heard about some of these secret cities the Soviets had uh, I was just happening to read about stuff this week talking about the secret cities we had uh, whether Los Alamos and uh, and the stuff that was developed in the nuclear bomb. They basically created secret cities here in the United States, too, and we, we don't hear about that too much even today. So but some of that's getting written about now. So it's just a really pertinent, really great program. Thank you. Yeah, I, I always think when I watch Duck and Cover that uh, whatever was happening then seems so quaint compared to what schools have to, and mild compared to what they have to worry about now. Yeah. And a lot of people have done satirical revisions of that film where they're ducking and covering from a shooter instead of and you can find those online actually I, I made one recently <laughs> I didn't want to put it here because it's too disturbing I think any other questions Thank you uh, for starting back up again. I've, I've attended your uh, showings in the past. Uh, relative to the, the war in Ukraine right now and talk of Russian propaganda, their suppression of journalism, it's refreshing to see um, uh, the, the, the news media around the world pointing out some of the uh, discrepancies that they have. I'm wondering if... Uh, Aside from the, the vintage model, if, if uh, uh, the, the library downtown has anything uh, in the current uh, range, or, or what these sources, are there uh, current... Uh, newer films? You new, mean? Newer films, but like the U.S. Information Service, what would be the U.S. equivalent of that now? They, they don't make it as obvious. Well, they, they kind of uh, folded up in 1999. Um, so the equivalent of that now would be Voice of America. and uh, You know, I, I've actually talked to people who used to be in the Foreign Service, and they, I mean, we laugh because it's propaganda, but they, some people uh, sort of lament us not having this U.S. information agency because they were trying to sell America put a positive light on it and we don't necessarily have that around the world the way we did. Uh, I don't know what I think of that because a lot of it wasn't true. <laughs> but, um, uh, could you put the, the um, tabs up? The, I mean, I, just as we're ending, I, I put some web pages up. Um, I'll just show you. It's, yeah, it's Firefox. So that's our web page. And the Vintage Movie Nights, the, they're linked. All the ones that we've done online are there if you want to watch more. And then the next tab, 
that's our YouTube channel, and I put a couple of the films, like the U.S. Overseas Information, that entire film is there. Um, and then the last tab is a lot of the films tonight came from this YouTube channel, which is always putting new things on, but um, you can see it's called Nuclear Vault, and um, it's a great channel if you're interested in this type of thing. All right, great. Oh, oh. Next topic. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. We talked about doing something in the fall. Yeah. Uh, we'll keep any, it rolling. You have to come any up. Any suggestions? With <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's hard to pick because there's so many options. There's so many possibilities. I thought about. There's this collection I really love called the Swarthmore College Peace Collection. Um, and they have a lot of uh, films that people don't normally see, and they're all, you know, it's Quaker perspective. Um, and I think it'd be nice to show a selection of those because I think a, a lot of people don't know about their collection. A lot of them are anti-Vietnam War films. Um, I don't think we've shown anything that was newer than like the 1980s. I guess about the time that VHS came in. <laughs> so I was inspired to do this by Rick Pralinger who collected like 60,000 films when they were get, being thrown away. And he does shows that he calls, he calls Lost Landscapes where he'll show old films of San Francisco, Oakland, Detroit. Um, and he keeps it you know, 1920s to 1980s. So I could sort of follow that model. All right, great. And if any, if you want to know about our upcoming vintage movie nights and other um, free events, and you can sign up for our e-newsletter on the uh, clipboard outside, or go to uh, TacomaParkMD.gov/arts. And thanks again for coming out tonight. And thank you, Richard. Thank you for coming out. Thank you.